2018, 6,507 people died from suicide in the UK. My younger brother, Sean, was one of them. He was 29 years old. Like most left behind after suicide, I have been left with unanswerable questions, tormented by guilt and regret, wondering what could have been done differently. I am making this film to try to understand why this happened in the hope that I can find some peace and that Sean's story can help to prevent future suicides. On Wednesday, June 13th, 2018, after a long battle with alcoholism which shrouded his deeper struggles with depression and low self-esteem, Sean walked out of his family home. His whereabouts for the next 24 hours are still unknown. At some point, he bought six litres of cider, went into a wooded area and took his own life. On the Friday morning, he was found by passers-by. A year later, and I'm driving to Bristol to meet my mother at the wooded area where he died. It will be the first time I have been there. So where are we going now? It's all in here. We're going in here? No, that one. Huh? That one. When Sean died, it was a heat wave, so at least it wasn't cold and dark yeah. and damp. Be careful. You come here quite often. Mm. This is the last day he was alive. Does that bring you comfort? Mm, sure. I just feel drawn to it. I don't know why. How do you feel being here now? Is it still...? No, it doesn't seem so raw now. So I came here straight away after it happened, probably before the funeral even. I just wanted to see if I could see anything and any clues or anything dropped or anything like that. Did you search this entire space? Yeah, I went all the way up there. It's the first time I've been here and it just feels... You don't feel anything here. I just, I can't imagine it. Mm. I can't imagine where he was, or, and I don't really think I want to imagine it. No. You know, but even I, though it was described. But I came here quite soon after a couple of times. I haven't been here for a while. Maybe that's what it is. This tiny space is so chaotic. It's different in the summer, you know, when it's warm, and it's, at the moment, it looks like a damp and drab and lonely place to die, which it was. I don't know, in the sunshine, and it didn't seem so bad. Yeah. I just mean, like, everything's going everywhere, everything's chaotic. But his life it's, is quite chaotic. But that's what I mean, it? it's kind of... It's quite fitting that... Mm. He was here on his own. So that nobody had to find him, and nobody loved had to find him. I don't know whether he thought of that, but... I think, I think, whether he thought of it or whether he, it was, I don't know, subconscious, I'm, I can imagine Sean doing that. I can imagine mm. him not wanting anyone to find him. I just think the fact that there was no letter, there was no preparation, I feel like he just came in here to get really, really pissed. I think we could, he'd intended to, and he would have done it straight away. Yeah. The fact that he was wandering, obviously, for two days, or didn't go home for two days. And then maybe the drink just kind of gave him that courage to do it. I don't know what he was thinking. Mm. 
Yeah, I'll check it. I probably won't come here again now. Yeah. I don't really want to come here again. I'm glad that I've come here and seen it, but I think it's, it's so strange because it's not what I imagined. You know, well, you're feeling all the places. I feel sick right now. I feel I've got that kind of heavy feeling in my stomach I get when I feel, when I think about Sean, but when I think about him, and it makes me sad. Sometimes I think about him and it makes me smile, makes me happy. But sometimes when I think, I just, I don't like this. This is a sad place. This is a sad place for me. This isn't it. And I, I can understand why you would be drawn here. I just want to get away from you right now. Fab rang me on the Thursday to say that she didn't know where Sean was. And they were going on holiday the next day to celebrate his 30th birthday. And I didn't, I wasn't really worried. I just thought, oh, he's, you know, he's gone off. I was in work and my phone went and all I could hear was somebody crying on the other end of the phone and Fab screaming. So the police, I think the police were still there then. And somebody was saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I, I think I knew then, I knew what had happened. A few days after his suicide, Sean's fiance Fab found his diary, giving us an insight into the battles he had faced with depression and alcoholism. So this is Sean's diary. He started it at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018. At some point during this diary, the hope that was, was in his words, it gets lost. I want to change my drinking habits so it doesn't affect anyone I love and care for and that love me. At this moment in time, I haven't had a drink since the 23rd of December, 2017 so I know I can go without. I have my struggles, up and downs, etc. but Monday to Thursday is easy. I can, not always, but can struggle on a Friday, Saturday, as it's been a habit for so many years. I've always ignored my issues and forgotten about them because I've not wanted to be a non-drinker. It's so socially accepted, but I'm not a normal drinker and I need to remember that. When I get home to my family, I shall be happy that I have achieved another day. Getting through the weekend is another test. Money not wasted and no remorse or resentment and letting myself and others down. I need to change the way my brain thinks. You know, Sean's self-medicated. Self-medication makes you depressed and being depressed makes you self-medicate and it becomes a vicious circle. While sober, I'm very aware of the pain I cause others, especially my family. My biggest fear is not feeling comfortable and out of place, being the only one not drinking. If I carry on drinking whilst angry, there's always that moment where it could be one too many drinks and turn into psycho Sean who makes the wrong decisions, acts like a cunt, and thinks in a paranoid, unrational way, making things up in his head and making no sense and not trusting people or even reality. He then writes in capital letters, it is not the way and I always think wrong and get proven wrong once sobered up. And for me, that's the most heartbreaking page of writing because that paragraph there is how I imagine him in the woods is being angry, being frustrated, being annoyed at himself, sitting there, having a drink. Because, you know, he went to buy six litres of cider. After six litres of cider, you can't do anything. He wanted to drink himself into oblivion. After half of one bottle, he's committed suicide. <sighs> what will it cost me if I don't change? Simple everything I care about. Fab, my kids, job, home, health. He wants to live. And he says, I will die or kill myself carrying on drinking without changing my thought pattern. I'm not angry, so why am I when I drink? And then he answers his own questions because it makes me think irrationally, you don't want to be that person. Positivity is key. And then he's put a little reminder for himself. Think of all the times you fucked up and could have lost everything. People care about me, remember. And that's what he's shouting at himself. It's like he's, you know, he's putting capital letters and he's shouting at himself, remember, people care about you. You know, this just, just shows how hard he was trying to battle his own demons. My temper is normal, I feel positive. I'm getting over the past and thinking about the future with my beautiful family. 
traveling, festivals. This won't happen if I don't change the way I'm thinking. The very next page, it sort of changes. He starts talking about his relationships and he says, Fab will eventually leave me. This is my final chance. Obviously, Fab and Sean had an argument before Sean walked out of the, the house on the, on the Wednesday. And um, I think he saw that as he'd had his final chance. I wouldn't see my children as much and not in the way I would like to. Think about how you feel about your own dad because he chose alcohol over his family. You are not that man. You are stronger than his problem. When Sean was three, our parents divorced. At the weekends, we would regularly wait for our father's visit, only for him not to show. Our father died in 2012, and I sometimes wonder if Sean ever stopped being the boy waiting in the window. Do you put any blame on Dad? I put blame on Dad before Sean died because he never made you feel like you were worth anything. He never made you feel love or care or support. He always put himself first. If he wanted to go out for a drink and he, he promised to come and see you, he'd go out for a drink and he'd just let you down and you'd be in the window and waiting for him. To me, he made you feel worthless. And I don't think that was a deliberate thing. It was, he was just selfish. Attachment is uh, an incredibly important way that we protect ourselves from the adversity that's all around us. So um, when a parent is there, they provide a relationship, and that relationship, that bond, persists in a person's imagination as well as in reality. So the person doesn't actually have to be there, that your father or your mother doesn't really have to be there in order to, for you to feel protected by that relationship. Because you imagine that if they were here, they would say, there, there, Peter. Uh, you know, you, you'll be all right. And they, it kind of gives you strength. The opposite of that, active rejection by a parent actually does harm. Uh, but the absence of a parent is less toxic, is more neutral. But if a child f expects a parent to be there and finds that the parent isn't there, they ask themselves the question, what's wrong with me? Why, why is it that I can't bring my dad to be here? To leave a child with no explanation leaves them vulnerable to find their own truth. And that then leads to a sense of inadequacy and to something even worse, which is a sense of shame. Now, shame is a terrible emotion for human beings because it makes them withdraw from social relationships. And I and many others think that shame is what actually drives the risk that's associated with many of those rejecting relationships, that people feel ashamed and then they withdraw. And when they withdraw, they feel vulnerable because it's the connections that keeps us protected. It's difficult to blame anyone. Who knows if things would have been different? Yeah. He could have, you know, he could have had a wonderful... We could have had a wonderful marriage, he could have had a wonderful upbringing, and he still could have ended up the same. It's hard to tell, isn't it? You can't, mm. it's, you can't really blame anyone. Has this problem made my life unhappy, yes. Drinking on my own, antisocially, in an angry state of mind, is a recipe for disaster. Obviously, he was drinking antisocially in an angry state of mind just before he committed suicide. This is no way, shape, or form acceptable. I think even his writing now is just starting to get more chaotic. You know, he talks about being aggressive and, and annoyed at himself and, and, and scaring his partner and his children and um, how they worry about him because he's being self-destructive. But then he talks about spending his money on drugs and drink to block out how out of order he's being. It's the self-perpetuating. He said, this is not OK, no way. You always want to be taken back and forgiven. And then he shouts at himself, always want to be forgiven. She will not always take you back and you will end up with nothing. You will lose everything. And that's the last, last thing he wrote in this book. I think this would have been a few days before he died. I'm Lila, and I'm nine. What was the best things about Daddy? Um, funny. It was funny? Mm-hmm. We were in Thailand, and we went... I forgot what they're called. 
quad bikes. Yeah, that's it. And we went on them, and Daisy drove really fast. And then Mummy was worried, and she said, "I have to go on her one." <laughs> but she wasn't going that fast. Whose did you want to go on? Daddy's. Because <laughs> <laughs> he was going faster. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Lila goes to um, uh, a counselling service called Winston's Wish, and her mum finds them really helpful, and they're very good with her. They're very they they they're gonna tell her how he died eventually, but they've they have talked about his drinking, and so they they're working around to tell her that he hurt himself. I suppose without her feeling a sense of rejection that he left mm. her. I... She was obviously upset when I told her, but kids respond in different ways. But then, yeah, the Winston's wish, just the way they know what they're doing and they open up questions and they give you a opportunity to speak together. But their last things and the way that they sort of break things down and they know how to sort of speak to children. And she's always keen to go. Lila she is. always wants to go, yeah. So it's obvious that she wants to talk about it. Mm. Winston's Wish started as a pre-bereavement charity over 27 years ago or so. But now, yeah, the service is for children who have been bereaved and their families. So they've, they've been able to sort of paint a picture a little bit more for her about what life was like a little bit more before he died to do with alcohol and things like that. And I think it's just going to have helped her with with an understanding a bit more as she gets older, As because sometimes maybe as a parent, unless they ask you a question, you're not necessarily going to sit down and straight away tell them when they're like sort of eight years old. In terms of uh, understanding their grief about somebody taking their own life. So it, understanding that dad has really struggled so much that he then needs to end feeling that way and so he hurts himself and dies. In order to process that, it's actually really helpful for the child to be able to take, be taken back and, okay, so dad really struggled. And you know when we would sometimes um, have arguments about dad's drinking? Well, that's because he was really, really struggling and I just wanted him to get better. So those arguments were happening because of that. And actually, drinking wasn't helping your daddy. And the child can sort of make sense then, oh, OK. And they may not remember a time when that was happening, but they can kind of then make sense of, oh, gosh, that's... They were actually poorly for a while. They didn't wake up one day and think, I don't really love my life or... I don't love my family anymore, I just want to end it. Sometimes him and Mummy would have fights. And... Sometimes he shouted at me. Sometimes it's because I was being naughty. And sometimes it's just because he was tired and a bit moody. When they're very little, they need it very concrete, not vague. Um, it's helpful to say died and dead than rather than saying um, they've gone to sleep. Um, and although that might feel that we're being more gentle and it might feel a bit easier for us to say that, we really have to put the child's understanding before our comfort levels of explaining. Mummy told me, but I didn't understand, so Grandma told me. And then I understand. Why, and why did you understand when Grandma told you? So Mummy said, like, I can't talk to Daddy anymore, and I thought they'd just broken up. But then Grandma told me that he died, so I understood that. What does the word died mean to you? Um, so, like, when somebody's not died, then it means you're living and you can walk and talk and hear. But then when you have died, you can't. And I've had several conversations with families at Winston's Wish where we say, so suicide is, is the word for when somebody hurts themselves and then they die. And the children say, oh, OK. And they actually outwardly don't seem like it's had the worrying impact that maybe the family thought it might have. Because actually it's another word for what they've already been told about. It's not new information about what happened. It, it, it's just another word to describe it for them. Do you remember when the lady from Winston's Wish told you how Daddy died? Um, I forgot what the word is, but she told me he killed himself. And, yeah. I forgot what the word is, though. Did that matter to you that that was how Daddy died? I was sad and a little bit confused. Yeah. What were you confused about? Like, why? They maybe missed them 
but are angry with them. Um, they love them, but hate them and feel confused. And we have to let that in. We can't just welcome them in and say, OK, let's think about all the wonderful things and the wonderful times. We need to be able to offer them a space to process all of that complex grief. Sometimes we ask people, um, you know, ha have you ever learned how mummy and daddy met? And the children are like surprised why we're asking. But usually it's because, well, actually the person who's died, there's way more to them than the fact that they died and how they died. You know, they had a whole life before that and a life before the children came along. So we find it really important and you can sort of see in the children, they think, oh, I haven't really thought about that actually. This one I cannot remember, but I'm so cute. <laughs> so cute? Yeah. You've got the same haircut as your dad. <laughs> Did you get his haircut like that so he'd look like you? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> At least you haven't got his beard. <laughs> yeah. That one, Mummy said that they went to St Andrew's Park when I was never born and nobody knew me. And um, Daddy climbed the like hugest tree ever yeah. and Mummy was scared. She even almost cried. Because he climbed a tree? But it was huge, yeah. He's a nutter, wasn't he? <laughs> Mummy said it was bigger than our house. Oh my gosh. We tend to find as sessions go on is that in the gaps between them, conversations that are usually just at Winston's Wish start to happen outside of Winston's Wish. And that is the, the best thing we could hope for. In the days, weeks and months after Sean's suicide, I was lost and alone in a world thrown upside down. I felt that no one could understand my pain. That was until I came across Sobs, a support group for people bereaved by suicide. Hearing the stories of other people's loss helped me to make sense of my own grief. Now I'm part of a club that no one wanted to join, but with friends who have become the most important people in my life. Our shared suffering eases the heartache and gives us hope to move forward. I'm Manthe and I lost my daughter Kerry on the 6th of April. I'm Julia. I lost my brother Andrew in March this year um, to suicide. My name's Cabby and last year my younger brother and best friend took his life January 27th. My name's Tamsin um, and I lost my brother in September 2016. My name's Luke and I lost my sister Leah um, on June the 3rd, 2018. My name is David. Uh, my brother ended his life in June of 2001. Uh, my name is John. Um, my son, Alex, who was 26, took his own life on the 1st of May 2017. I'm Jo, and I lost my son in June last year. Andrew was um, very polite, very well-mannered. That's what everyone always used to say about him. You know, he was funny. We always had a laugh together when we saw each other. But he felt very deeply about things and just, I think, maybe wasn't always able to show it. If there was anything to be into, she was in it, so he would have had no idea whatsoever. She was just so outgoing, love life, as we thought. Very sensitive, very witty, but, like, had his own very distinct sense of humour. We were very close in age. It was, there was actually 11 days we were the same age. Um, I think they call it Irish twin. <laughs> he was uh, artistic, he was uh, loving, he was very loyal, and he was, uh, he was funny as well. She was very, very shy, I would say. Um, growing up, she's quite shy, she's quite quiet. Um, she was a very loyal person. Such a kind, easygoing young man. It's really difficult to, to get over <laughs> what a warm human being he, he was. Well, his younger sister, Talitha, said, Jared, was the kind of person you would want to know. Um, he was very calm, mild-mannered. John was the most easygoing, relaxed, laid-back, nothing-ever-bothered-him kind of guy I have ever known. Obviously, something shows how was bothering him. But, yeah, we were very close. He was my brother. He was also my best mate. And he was just a hammer blow. 
Hilly went to see him on the Monday night, the 11th, and he was the best he'd been for a couple of months. So what the hell happened between 10 o'clock-ish when Haley left and the early hours of the Tuesday morning? When he sort of told us, oh, I'm sort of depressed, we just put it down to, oh, he's failed some exams, which he did, and he's depressed now. And, and, and that was sort of the jigsaw we tried to put into that puzzle was like, oh, he's only sad because he failed his exams. What, what we couldn't really understand at the time was, quite naive of us, was that he failed his exams because he was depressed. Even knowing that now, after my brother's passing, that was the general narrative that a lot of our extended family got away with. Oh, he was struggling at university with his academics. He was, he got sad and he did this. And like, that's it, they've got their answer. It's, <laughs> that, that pisses me off. Yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, they, they just want a straightforward, clean cut answer and it's never gonna be like that with mental health. She definitely had had those feelings quite a lot. Whenever she was in a hospital, she'd overdosed. She was so, like, sorry that she did it. She was always happy that it didn't, she didn't go through with it, you know? And I think it would have been the same. I just think it was a moment of madness, just a split second. Should I have seen signs? Should, you know, should I have known something was wrong? I found out that what was getting him down was more than anything. He wanted to be in a long-term relationship and have a family, and to him, that's what he wanted most. He felt like he'd failed in certain relationships, breaking down. He had sought help from the community mental health team around depression, around that sort of thing. Um, but then he got into a relationship and was deemed to be moderate risk, but, you know, it was that much from nosediving, you know, into the abyss when that relationship failed. My niece had suicidal thoughts and tendencies and because through her army cadet training, she would phone up and find like, safeguarding roles. So she would phone up the police and get them to go around and see my niece. But she'd help everyone else and not didn't know it was happening to her. So that's really difficult. She wanted to save her, but couldn't save herself. At her funeral, um, you know, one of, one of her friends came up to my mum and said, you know, Leah actually saved my life and she was going to commit suicide. And, you know, Leah was there for her and talked her out of it and saved her life. His marriage had broken up amicably. As I said, I, I went back countless times every couple or few months to try and find out why. I even saw his doctor. She seemed to think that the, the marriage breakdown had something to do with it. I don't know. I simply don't, don't know. He was ill from about 13, really. Um, I suppose when he was younger, it was one of those things where um, you don't know whether he's actually just going through sort of the normal adolescent stuff or whether he is sort of, you know, whether there's a bit more to it. He was uh, very ill, constantly in and out of hospital. My parents were taking him to hospital almost every day because he was saying that he wanted to kill himself. And uh, it got to a point where he started hearing voices. And this was around the time he got diagnosed. So they diagnosed him with uh, borderline personality disorder um, and bipolar. He was in a ward for about um, a month. But in the end, they uh, decided to discharge him early. There was no care plan. There was uh, no support. We weren't even warned that he was going to be released. So he came out on the Monday and then he committed suicide on the Wednesday. Jared was beginning his third year of university. Um, my middle son had taken an overdose, but fortunately we found Caleb and took him to A&E and so on. And so, like I said, I, I said to Jared, you know, we're going to be fine. Just go back to uni, concentrate on getting your final year done. However, I noticed when he came back in about the March, he wasn't quite himself. And I thought it was exam stress and 
the stress we'd been through, I had to go and get him because it was clear that he wasn't eating and sleeping well and he crashed. I'd been on a business trip uh, a month before Alex died. I was there for two nights, so the first night we went out, we had a meal, it was fun. His girlfriend came and joined us at the end of the evening. And then the next night, I met him and she was working. And he seemed off. And he, he said he was out of sorts. He said he hadn't slept very well the night before. I remember reaching up my arms around him and, and sort of having to go up to you know, hug him. Um, and we said goodnight and told each other we, we loved each other. And that's the last time I saw him alive. And what I suspect is the night before she'd broken up with him. The 4th of April, the doctor phoned her and said, how are you feeling? She said, yeah, I'm OK. Phoned her again in the afternoon and she said, no, I'm not feeling so great. The doctor then phoned the police. The police then went to the station to pick her up. They took her home and no one knew. There wasn't anyone they called. They were satisfied that she was OK. She'd been to see her doctor and she was on antidepressants for, you know, years and years. Um, she tried Kingston, but like I said, she wasn't really much of a talker. She didn't like sitting down talking to people about her problems, especially someone she didn't know. Everything seemed to be going better. I think the last few months before she died, everything seemed to be going better. She was opening up like a lot with my mum actually and their relationship was really good. She just crashed, you know, and it was just too much. But I don't for one second believe she, you know, she wanted to go. I think, and okay, I think in the moment she did, but I don't think, yeah, I think it was just that like split moment decision. I rang him on the Friday and his phone was turned off. So I thought, oh, maybe the battery's died or whatever. So I did my usual text message, you know, call me when, or text me when you've got this message. And then um, I spoke to my partner, Kizzy, to please check on Jared on the way. And I, I still felt, you know, he it would be fine. He's just forgotten to let me know. Kizzy has opened the door. Jared had left the door open. It wasn't ajar, but it was unlocked. And he'd gone in. So I'm on the phone the whole time. And then I heard Kizzy saying, let me call you back. Let me call you back. And I knew something was very wrong. And those minutes felt like hours. So I was constantly calling back. And then Kizzy had answered. I don't even know the time frame there. It was just a blur. And Kizzy had said, you've got to be strong. He's gone. And all I could do was oh, just it was an odd kind of sound. It was almost like an animal whimpering sound. I can't describe those moments. The turmoil, the inner turmoil. Um, the helplessness. <sighs> and the feeling that you can't change it. And all you want to do is change it. If I didn't go and see my son, I know I would have been thinking, I wonder if it really did happen. I wonder if that was Jared. I had to go into the room and identify Jared. And... And now my mind plays back to that quite often to remember it has happened. Uh, it was Monday morning. 1st of May 2017, my uh, mobile phone went and I looked at it and it was my oldest son. My first thought was something's wrong. And I can't remember exactly the words he said, but I remember my reaction and sort of dropping to my knees and my world changed from that point. It's almost like an out of body experience. Like I felt like I was sort of at the back of my brain seeing somebody else do what I was doing. Just a feeling of desolation, unbelievable loss, and also part of you 
not wanting to and not quite believing it's true, thinking this is some horrible nightmare. And I'll wake up in a minute in a cold sweat, it'll all be fine. How has your life been since Andrew's suicide? I don't really know how to describe it because it's been... It's been kind of polarised, I think. Um, so before Andrew died, like, I was dealing with my own mental health issues. I was seeing a therapist. Um, I'd been seeing a therapist for two and a half years. And then when Andrew died, you know, we had spoken about our, our own mental health issues before then. Um, and I'd spoken about going to a therapist, and that wasn't something he was willing to do. He didn't feel like it would help him. He kind of said to me, you know, it's not even helping you. You've been going for two and a half years and you're still in this position. But I don't think he could see the progress I'd made. He left a note when he died um, and said to me, you know, I really hope that you can get through this where I couldn't. And that's given me strength and put into perspective my own mental health issues and, like, how I've responded to certain things. Empty. Really empty. I miss it so much. But... I've got two sons, so... and grandchildren. So we get on the best we can. But, yeah, there's a hole. 18 years on, that there is nothing like the, the shock, the pain, now as it was in those early years, actually. I don't know, I can't remember how long it took for me to find some kind of semblance of normality, whatever the hell that is. I feel like I've got a hole in my heart. A piece of me is missing, and I'm never going to get it back. Um, yeah, it's, um, I, I've tried to persevere, but good days and bad days is what I tell most people. But um, I was actually thinking about that. I, I, a lot of people always ask me, oh, how are you doing? And my, my defensive classic answer is, oh, good days and bad days. And it's just what rolls off my tongue. But I was thinking about it on the way in. There's a third option. And that third option is, is there's good days and there's bad days. And, there's days the pain will rip right through me and I wonder whether it's all worth it. But um, people aren't ready to hear that third option and neither do, they, neither do they really want to know. So, yeah, good days and bad days is what I say. I've felt just devastated that I've wanted to say, you know, let's just go back and replay that bit because I know what to do now. Um, but it's just not possible. That, that first night I went home after John died on the Tuesday, I slept in John's and made bed that night with the bedroom door open and the, the loft where he'd hung himself from. I didn't get a wink of sleep all night, just staring up at the... I'm not religious, but just wanting his spirit to come back there or something and tell me why the hell he done what he'd done. Nothing happened, of course, but just that desperate desperation. That is one of the things about suicide. I think you have all these what ifs, and um, I'm kind of I kind of see myself as a bit lucky in a way that it wasn't unexpected completely for me. I mean, there's plenty of people I've spoken to at Sobs, who uh, and like yourself, who had no idea that it was going to happen. Uh, it was completely out of the blue, even though. It, it, even though it was kind of expected, it was still a surprise. You don't really ever think that will happen, but I was prepared for it in some way. I'm just so aware, and I have high, sure it really can be. Um, I do think about death quite a lot, actually, and I do think, oh, what's the point of it? You know, I never thought like that before. Like my whole mentality is so different since later, and I just I drift in and out of different emotions. Sometimes I feel like it's almost selfish for me to want her to be here, because I tell myself, you know, she was in such pain, and now she's not in pain. And yeah, it's, it's just a part of my everyday, though. These thoughts, these, you know, constantly, like, battling different ideas. You know, oh, you know, she wanted to go. No, she didn't. It was a moment of madness, you know. Um, I could have had, could, everything could have been different. No, it couldn't have changed anything. It's just like this battle. And I'm 
I don't, yeah, I don't really know how to think about it. I'm just so confused. I'll never get any answers. I don't think anyone in our situation will never, will never know why. No. We'll never understand. It's just a grief like nothing I've ever known. Yeah. I lost both my parents. Again, if there's any consolation, John is out of the pain he was in. Plus, both my parents went before him for, the, for them to live with it. He'd taken his own life. Wow. Just beyond comprehension, right? I, I was just a wreck in, in, to the extent that my family did an intervention and pulled me off to see a doctor. Um, I was that bad. I was, you know, breaking down into tears and I, I had no interest in doing anything, you know, wasn't shaving. Yeah, I, I was just, I was just absolutely overcome. Um, and I think, you know, the, the shock had sort of pushed off that tsunami of grief for a year. And then once once it, it came on, then I, I just, you know, it was too much. It's almost the pain is a conduit to your memory of that person. And it's very, very difficult. And, and you, you're, the, you're pulled in both directions all the time and just accepting, okay, well, that's the way it is. It's not, you know, there's no getting over it. There's no getting better. There's no coming to terms with it. There's no, um, acceptance per se is it's it's really this is the way it is this is who I am now I'm a different person and how do I long term just accept that and, and be the best person I can my mum was always constantly worried about Andrew because um, he used to go out on the weekends she wouldn't maybe hear from him for a couple of days he would go out on his own drink a lot do a lot of drugs um, get himself into situations where she would just be fearing for his life. And it sounds awful, but in that sense, we're not having that constant fear about what might happen to him because it's already happened now. Nothing else can, can be worse than this. But actually, for my mum, although I think at, at first she kind of thought it might be like that. You know, the worst has happened. I'm not having to stay awake all night, every night. She's still grieving so intensely. And she's living with my sister, so she's moved in with her. She can't be in her own house. Um, I feel like the whole family dynamic has changed um, and that I'm having to be more of a support for my mum. I think there's just this underlying sadness between us now. There's no... There's no kind of happiness to be had. Sorry, I can't get emotional now. Yeah, I think it's just hard to know how to be with each other. Do you think the grief for suicide is different to normal grief? Yeah, because I think the the guilt part, you know, this, the, all the stages you go through, the guilt part seems to last. Well, I don't know, but the guilt, you know, the what ifs. If someone dies from an illness or an accident, there's nothing you can do about it, but, you know, you keep thinking, well, you could have done. But I feel like I let him die. I was his big brother. No, but I think, but I was his mother. I should have been able to protect him. I think he felt that he was letting everyone else down. That's exactly, I completely agree. There's specific times that I remember so clearly where I think, if I'd done something different there, that might have changed. Everyone I've spoken to in sobs and everyone says the same thing, they mm. all go back in time. And that's what I mean in terms of, well, I think, what you're yeah. talking about, the guilt. I think suicide is, is a different... That's, that's why there is sobs, isn't it? Because it is a different kind of bereavement. Well, I went to the doctors with him a week before. He did kill himself and he told the doctor then that he'd made two previous attempts, so then I knew. But I thought, he's gone for help now, it'll be all right. And we talked about it and he was going to go for counselling. And he never, ever said that he was depressed. He never, he never told me he was struggling. He was always happy, he was always singing and, you know, playing music. Mm. Having already been through a similar incident with my middle son, I would have thought I would be more in tune with that. But that's not the case, because every single person is different. We all carry uh, a particular burden 
genetically. We're all more or less likely to have a particular uh, predisposition to anxiety or to depression or even to suicidality. Uh, but what we know is that it doesn't need to actually happen just because you have a predisposition. I think he went into that wooded area to, to get drunk um, and in his diary he, he kind of taught you, you, you can see the, the, the impulsive nature and he knows how impulsive he is particularly when he was drinking and, and that's what happened. He went into there I think angry, confused, depressed to sort of drown his sorrows and an impulse went in his in his um, mind and he committed suicide and I think that was a lot to do with the fact that he hadn't felt supported by the system leading up to it because it was only a week before that he was speaking to a counsellor trying to trying to um, grab hope from somewhere. See, that's, that's what I feel bad about because Sean asked me to go to the doctors with him and I knew that he'd made a previous, he, he admitted that he'd tried before and I wanted to say to the doctor, can you not do something, can you not admit him somewhere? But then he's self-employed and that might have been the wrong thing because then he couldn't have worked and couldn't have paid his rent, I could have made him homeless. You know, it was, all of these things were going through my head when I was there and I thought, he's a grown man, he has to do it himself, he has to say to them what he needs. But now I think, you know, maybe I should have said more. I just sat there with him thinking I was supporting him and maybe I wasn't. So when somebody dies by suicide, it's really common for the people left behind to feel a sense of responsibility, to feel like somehow it was either their fault or that there was something they missed, something they could have done. And the reality is that in hindsight, it's really much easier to look back and think, oh, could I have intervened at that point or this point or done this? Or, But you don't have hindsight at the time. You know, if we knew at the time the person was going to kill themselves, of course we would have behaved differently. Death and suicide is so, so different because that she was young, she's healthy, but she chose to do that. And it's why, what ifs, what could have I done different? And you're left with all that and no answers. And I think that's so hard. It's a different grief because we have a different relationship. Losing a child under any circumstance, I should imagine, is a very different grieving process regardless. But losing a child to suicide adds another dimension because you always know it could have been preventable. Um, suicide is unpredictable, but it's preventable. And it's just equipping yourself with the tools for the, the signs, because now in reflection, I can see all the signs were there. He was so young, he was 20 years old when he took his life. It's just, it's one thing that's hard to come to terms with is that, yeah, all, those, all these memories we've shared are all the memories we've shared. There's, there'll be no more watching Friends reruns. There'll be no more wrestling in the living room. There'll be no more getting into trouble. It's, that's it. It, it's finished, and yeah, that's that's a tough one to stomach. It's always a case of you know why, and you know so many unanswered questions. What could I have done? You know how could you change it? So I think it's. One, yeah, it's one of the main emotions that you feel that maybe other people here in bereavement wouldn't feel. I think as a society, we're not very good at dealing with death in general. Um, people find grief quite hard to deal with. Um, and I mean, people around you who uh, look at you as a grieving person, they don't know how to approach it, they don't know what to say to you. And I think that's 
quadrupled when you're talking about someone who's committed suicide. It just feels so avoidable. Uh, and, and that's one of the key things. It's just like, if, if my brother was hit by a car, I would be fucking devastated. Uh, but then all these questions and this guilt and this anguish and, and all the other things that sort of resonate after suicide wouldn't be there. And, but then when it's suicide, it's, it's just the questions, it eats you up. Was it my fault? How much pain was he in? That haunts me how much pain he must have been in to make a decision like that. And then when something like this sort of happens on your watch, if you will, you just feel like, am I a failure as a big brother? I just, yeah, I just never can let go of the, uh, the sort of... that I was, I'm partly responsible there. I beat myself up and I have this, you know, the, the usual sort of conflict between logically knowing I couldn't have done anything, but emotionally feeling responsible as a parent. You know, I miss him terribly. And you know, what, what recently is starting to form more in my mind is I miss who he would have become. Uh, and, and if he had had that long-term relationship and, and family, he would have been a wonderful partner and father. Just he was so kind, he was such a gentle person. And knowing that you know, that's never going to happen now is uh, it's difficult. When you lose a child in this way, you feel you should have done something or you should have recognised something. Um, and you do ask those questions, what if, what if? And maybe if I had have rang him, we would have had a conversation. And he, it may be that he would have come out of that cycle of thinking. I just don't know, and I'll never know. But as a parent, no, I feel like I should have protected him or um, prevented it in some way. We all know, like, he was so unhappy and we don't, like, although it's, we want him back, we don't want him back in that way because that feels selfish. We don't want him back to be unhappy. We want him back if there could be a chance that things could change, that he could find a way out of it. I think one of the reasons that, uh, that grief is different when it's suicide is because people don't talk about suicide a lot. People do talk about mental health a lot more now than they used to, but people don't want to talk about suicide. It's uh, it's quite shocking, I think, still. I think maybe because of... And the other reason that I think it's uh, more difficult to deal with than other kinds of grief is because often it's quite a sort of violent way that someone ends their life. Um, uh, We've got a bit of a rule in my group where we don't talk about the method too much, and I don't want to talk about the method, but I think it, it is quite... It's quite, um, you know, doing that to yourself. It's... it's um, the only other thing that I can think of as maybe worse is someone being murdered. It's, uh, it's sort of unnatural, and... Um, and I think, yeah, people don't want to touch on it, and that can be really difficult when you're going through a really hard time and you just want to talk about the grief that you're feeling. People not wanting to interact with you about that is really difficult. Um, and again, that's why I found SOB so helpful. Because you're surrounded by people who are happy to talk about it and want to. I attended my first SOB session, I think, in the order, August, September time frame of 2017, after I'd moved back from the US. Um, came along knowing exactly, you know, what was going to go on and how, how it was going to work. I went into the room and the circle of chairs and um, I think the first person I met was David who facilitates a lot of the sessions. Yeah, we are a support group for people bereaved by suicide. Hopefully they, they are getting something from coming along and just sharing with other people the, the sense of loss. You know, attending SOB, there was an instant sort of sense that people had this common shared understanding of what it's like to lose somebody to suicide that 
people who haven't lost somebody to suicide will never understand and you will never wish them to understand. People share meaningful uh, thoughts, uh, you know, platitudes, they, they share some intimate uh, aspects of their loss and what's going on with them. Just the way people phrase things, they say things, you feel, yeah, okay, you get it, I get it. And, you know, just the, the support, people genuinely care. I don't think about him an awful lot, which is why it's, I think it's healthy for me to go to sobs, because when I go to sobs, I really think about him, and it's a good opportunity to, uh, yeah, to really just think about him for a full two hours, whereas normally I wouldn't think about him an awful lot. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I would say my memories are a lot more positive now than they, than they were a few years ago. Uh, at my workplace, being vulnerable is the last thing you want to be seen as or really put out there. And with my family, there is definitely a cultural gap between us and I never truly feel comfortable talking about my feelings to them. And that's what SOBS is sort of providing for me at this point. It's just somewhere where I can just not really care about what I'm saying and just be vulnerable for those two hours twice a month. Just meeting other people who are in the same position. Um, and you actually realise how many people are in the same position. And it's scary because it's a lot more than you would think. We go there to help ourselves, but we also go there to help each other. And I look forward to seeing people. I uh, look forward to catching up, even though we talk about something that's horrible and negative and full of grief. There's a, a strong positive side of it in terms of a sense of, of people looking out for each other in a, in a truly meaningful sense of human spirit and we're there for each other. That's a great thing about it, that if you do come in angry and pissed off at everything and, you know, and everyone, um, it's okay because people understand it and it's a safe place to do that. And I think it's important that we know, like I said, these things stick to us through the day and through the weeks and you know it's okay because when I get to sobs I can just let it all out. Our mission, I think, as survivors needs to be to get the word out there and, and try and destigmatize suicide. People treat us as survivors as if they think we're going to be ashamed and I think we need to break that down and say, no, we're not ashamed of the people we lost. They were lovely people. They were having a hard time. Something went wrong in their lives and you know, maybe something was wrong with their brain chemistry or whatever it was. But that doesn't mean we don't acknowledge them as being wonderful people who are you know, a massive part of our lives. I think we have to get creative and we have to talk to people who've been there and hear from them what would have helped them. So my name's Johnny and I'm a, a mental health campaigner. My mental health issues started uh, really young. My parents took me to um, uh, a psychologist when I was five, so when I was really small. When I was in my, my final year of university, I had a, a psychotic breakdown. Um, and uh, I, I kind of felt like my, my mind, my body was being taken over, but that led me to being admitted to a psychiatric hospital and, and being given this diagnosis of um, schizoaffective disorder. When I, when I got given my diagnosis at 20, that's when, like, well, suicide was really the only option to go on. I just, I couldn't go on. There was, I, I, I thought I'd be given this, this illness for life. I was going to be in hospital for, like, the rest of my life or medication. I, was, I wasn't going to get to, you know, have, have a family or a job. I was going to be a burden on, on everyone. Now I've got a career in mental health and uh, written books and stuff, and I know that people on the outside look at me and think, you know, well, you look fine. I see it all the time when people, unfortunately, you know, take their own lives. Other people are just like, I don't get it. If, if you could just maybe spend just even like, you know, just a day inside my head or, or that person's head or whoever said it is that is struggling, that's going through suicidal thoughts or feelings, then maybe you would understand. Because you don't know, you know, on the outside, everything might look fine, I might be really successful and might be going about my day-to-day, -day, but you just, you've got no idea. The professional support that we can give will always be a drop in the ocean compared to the level of need. 
I think we really need to go through a step change, a, a different understanding of human need in terms of the support that we give each other as just people trying to struggle with life in order for us to really genuinely reduce the burden of mental disorder. I think we need more and more people on the ground, you know, people, grassroots people. When I see more and more, like, grassroots, um, you know, uh, charities and organisations that are, are like, do you know what, we can take things into our own hands. And I think that's what, what is happening and what needs to happen because we can't rely anymore on, on the government or on, you know, the services. But certainly I think for people like myself, teachers, anyone in the, in the mental health or, or medical profession, um, policemen, police women, um, you know, any of those services, I think it should be uh, mandatory that we have that training. My name is Jamal Hatton. I worked in mental health for 15 years. I'm ex-Samaritan and I attempted suicide myself in 2012. From 2015, um, I became a mental health first aid instructor. I delivered a half day, one day and two day mental health um, adult courses and the half day, one day and two day youth courses, which is for teachers and, and, and youth workers. I loved the course. It was what I wanted, part of my recovery. Uh, I actually sat the two day course originally um, and I love the fact that it normalised it. And again, we're, we're looking at it in the workplace. And I think in the workplace, it's, it's vital that we, we take med our mental health seriously. Mm. A lot of people say, well, what is mental health or what's mental health first aid? Just like a physical first aider. It's about seeing somebody in front of you and what can you do in that immediate moment. The course that we do is about giving people not just the skills, but the confidence and some of the knowledge to see some of the early warning signs and having that confidence to be able to say to somebody, how are you feeling today? Starting up that dialogue with people on a very, very, very basic level to rebuild their own resilience, to find their answers to their own problems. He was only new at his workplace, only worked there for six months. But if people could see that Jared had taken a number of days off, if people had had training to know he's quite withdrawn, he, he's not really engaging so much, if people had had that gateway training, it, it may be very different. I mean, all the guys that came through his funeral from the construction site came up to me and said to me, I wish Andrew had said something. But I know almost for a fact, if he had said something to them at the time, they would have just been like, oh, fuck off, like, you're a gay boy or something. And now that Andrew's gone and they can see what's happened, maybe they'll approach that situation differently. I'm sure Andrew isn't the only person on that site of maybe like 200 people experiencing something like this. There are probably about 1.2 million children and young people at the moment with a diagnosable mental disorder in England alone. Now, no matter how much you improve the mental health service, there will be insufficient number of professionals to meet that need. Unless we start doing things differently in our schools, in families, uh, in the communities that we create around children. I think that's the only point that would have changed. I think once he got to adulthood, he felt he was too far gone. Um, I dream about him a lot since he's died, and I always dream about him as a child. And I think that's because I feel like that's the point where something could have been different, that he could have... He could have been more seen, um, and more understood. And I think just being labelled as naughty and disruptive was so damaging for him because he wasn't that. And ultimately, you know, he's not here anymore. A lot of my brother's signs, looking back on it, were all there. And he was, as far as I'm concerned, he was begging for help, although I couldn't see it at the time. But it's just, you just end up hating yourself for it. But I, I was in just, entirely ignorant to mental health uh, until everything happened recently. Uh, but my brother had been suffering with anxiety and panic attacks uh, as a young child, and I, I didn't really pay much attention to it. Um, and, and that haunts me. 
Yeah, that, that haunts me. You know, we teach kids from a young age about their dental health, don't we? You know, we, we teach them about brushing their teeth. And why, at the same time, don't we do the same about their, their mental health? You get them used to, yeah, talking about what's going on for them, their thoughts, their feelings, and not, not shutting them down. There are some great projects in schools looking at, you know, helping children to get emotionally literate, to, do, to be able to name their emotions. Um, we have at home some emojis hanging on our wall so that, you know, our younger kids who might not have the language yet can actually point and say, that's how I'm feeling. With things like, you know, the child and adolescent mental health services ending at 18 and just that massive cut-off in between the, the child services and the adult services where so many people are lost in that gap and no one's doing anything to change it. The move from naught to 18, from naught to naught to 25 is really important because of the transition period, particularly now that uh, young people become independent in general a little bit later, that has become an even more acute problem, that we need to really recognise that the nature of the help that we offer to young people actually is continuous, uh, doesn't have a disruption, and suddenly at 18 they turn from children to adults. And it's uh, not necessarily terribly easy to see how the service organisation that we are currently working with will be able to accommodate that shift, but making that shift we must do. Mental health services in this country are woefully underfunded. Absolutely woefully underfunded. The problem is with limited resources, you have to try to target the riskiest people. I think things have improved quite a lot compared to even five years ago. Um, but while while people have got a lot better talking about it, the money's gone down. And I think you have to be quite realistic with this. It's going to cost money to kind of sort out uh, people's mental health issues. I do think when I really think about it, if, if there had been more funding, when my brother committed suicide, I think perhaps he'd still be alive because I don't think they would have released him. I think they, I think they released him early because they needed a bed. A few years ago, the government introduced a scheme to try and help uh, people to access talking therapies more easily. And it's been a brilliant success, but it's almost been too successful because now the waiting lists for that are getting longer and longer and longer. So whilst people are now feeling more comfortable coming for support, the support just simply isn't there, but particularly in certain areas like child and adolescent mental health. I have a good friend who's a GP who thinks that everybody ought to have a little mental health MOT once a year, you know? Wouldn't that be amazing? Just to normalise it in that way like we do with, with physical health, because that's all this is. Mental illness is just like physical illness. You know, I have bipolar affective disorder and I'm an alcoholic, but I also have an underactive thyroid. You know, I treat them the same. They're the same. In 2006, the suicide prevention charity CALM was launched with the single objective of lowering the staggeringly high suicide rate in the UK. Fifteen years later, they continue to grow and gather momentum in the fight against suicide. CALM is leading a movement against suicide, um, but we don't do that by dwelling on suicide. We do that by dealing with the opposite of suicide. So, to our mind, the opposite of suicide is life. And the opposite of misery, as in a miserable life, is, is happiness. And, and we encapsulate that into hope. So we try to provide hope for people uh, who are at a point of crisis or are nowhere near that yet. Um, but, but hope is the thing. And in doing so, we've grown from being a, a mental health charity to being what we're terming a, a popular movement now. I think all we can do reasonably is to learn from those who've been there, been to the edge and come back and survived, and think, OK, how can we try to prevent future suicides from happening? And how can we best support people and help people to understand and come to terms with what's happened when they're left behind? So there's hope in survival. So there are lots and lots of people who support us because they had got to that point of despair where it felt to them that a permanent solution to what turned out to be temporary problems was their only option. There are lots of people who now enjoy a happy life and they want other people to know that if you do get to that, that point where you're, you're banging right up against it, that there's always a reason to hang around. There's always a reason to see what comes next. There is an alternative. You just need to find it and it shouldn't be that it comes to this kind of 
crescendo like that, that's the only way you can find it. We are there, we are talking more about mental health, but it's the next generation that are actually acting on it. Because of the next generation, things will hopefully be different. And there's hope uh, in, a, in a, a terrible and wonderful way in people who are directly affected by suicide. The way that they can turn their, that anger into uh, a determination that nobody else will suffer what they've suffered. Uh, and we see it time and time again that our most vociferous supporters will try to help us to grow this popular movement, to disseminate hope, to give people a view that there is life, there, is, there, there are options. Every single day we're seeing hope and we're seeing people who are really determined to spread their message that you can expect and strive for and demand a life that isn't miserable. My mother and my father and my brother, who died before I was born, are buried in the cemetery in Cardiff. He was on work experience uh, in a carpenter's when he was about 16. And to give him something to do, I asked him to make a cross for the grave because we couldn't afford a headstone. So he made this massive wooden cross and he carried it home over his shoulder. And he came on and he said, everybody was beating their horns at me. I, can't, I couldn't understand why he didn't understand the significance of walking up the street with a cross on his shoulder. <laughs> well, that was quite funny. So the cross is there. It will be a reminder of him now as well because he made that cross. And I'd like Sean's ashes to go in this, the, the plot with my mother because I'd like the children to have somewhere to take flowers on his birthday and on Father's Day, maybe Christmas. I'd just like them to have somewhere to go because they don't really understand where he is or what's happened. If there is anything, my mum would be looking after him anyway. But she only had him for a year. He was only one when she died, so she can have him forever now. Who's in there, Mum? My brother, who died before I was born, my nana, my mother's mother, and my mother and father. And now my baby. <laughs> the light goes out, and it's dark. All the strength I have flows from my heart, and it aches. My stomach crunches, my arms are weak, my legs are hollow and I fall to the floor. The tears that fell in that first moment, the first moment of a world never imagined, cover my body and protect me. No more tears will be cried for a while, a shock takes hold and numbs me to the world around. I can't move, I can't hide, I can't escape. Your absence is everywhere. It's only in my dreams that you'll grow old now, but days feel like dreams, and dreams feel so real. The broken pieces of my shattered heart block the flow of breath. Unexpected smiles I reminisce are all I have left of you, but memories torture the peace that I crave. <laughs>